If you were looking for solutions to male pattern hair loss, then the chances are that you've come across ads for platelet-rich plasma therapy, or PRP. The term sounds straight out of Star Trek, but it's actually a very simple procedure. And the advertisements often suggest that you'll get hair regrowth straight out of science fiction. But guys, is this realistic? Well, in today's video, we'll explain exactly what PRP is and how it's supposed to treat hair loss before turning to the million dollar question. What are the chances that PRP will work for you? And if it does, what kind of results can you realistically expect to see? Make sure to stay tuned. Hey guys, Leon here from HairGuard, where people who are worried about their hair loss go to regrow their hair. Now, just before we get into the video on PRP, if you want to get access to the hair nutrition plan, then make sure to click the link in the description. You get 21 delicious recipes designed specifically for faster, stronger hair growth. The meals are loaded with nutrients like biotin, zinc, and collagen to make hair as thick and strong as possible. So first guys, what exactly is PRP? So blood is made up of two major components, the cellular part, which contains cells like red blood cells, etc., and the fluid part or the plasma. The plasma consists primarily of water and proteins. To make plasma, you put a blood sample into a device called a centrifuge and you spin it at a very high speed. What happens is this separates the blood into its cellular and plasma components. To prepare PRP after you've spun the blood, you use a special syringe to extract the platelet-rich portion of the plasma. Platelets are the component of blood that allows it to clot, like for example when you get a scrape or a cut. Now, due to the way that PRP is prepared and extracted, it contains a much higher, greater concentration of platelets relative to whole blood, between three to seven times higher. After the application of local anesthetic, the PRP is then injected into the balding area of the scalp. PRP is broadly classed as a regenerative medicine practice. It is based on the idea that the high-density platelets deliver a variety of growth factors to the scalp, and these growth factors prompt the body to heal itself through stem cell regeneration and soft tissue remodeling. These growth factors are contained in the 40 to 80 organelles which are in each platelet and are called alpha granules. When these are activated, the growth factors are released. What is PRP used for? It's important to understand that PRP was not developed specifically for hair loss or androgenetic alopecia. It actually goes back half a century and was originally developed for use in hermatology patients. Then, surgeons picked it up and started using it to facilitate various kinds of surgery. Today, it's used to accelerate healing in other dermatological conditions like ulcers, vitiligo, acute traumatic wounds, as well as musculoskeletal injuries and problems with tendons and ligaments. Despite Despite the fact that PRP is only administered by doctors, it is a little bit controversial amongst the medical community. The crucial point involves the relative lack of clinical data, as well as the fact that we don't fully understand just exactly how PRP is supposed to work. But perhaps the most important issue is the lack of standardization. In other words, how wildly different the treatment protocols are from one clinic to the next, which we'll discuss shortly. This has led some medical bodies to view it as the quote, wild west of regenerative medicine. So what about PRP for hair loss? Well, PRP is thought to promote hair growth via A, increasing the survival and proliferation of hair follicle cells, B, stimulating follicles to transition from the resting to the antigen growth phase of the hair cycle, as well as C, prolonging the antigen phase. The combination of higher density and hairs that are growing out longer leads to improved hair coverage. As mentioned earlier, there is no agreement on the exact biological mechanism through which PRP actually accomplishes this, which is not surprising considering many doctors don't even consider PRP an effective treatment. According to one theory, the growth factors released by the platelets stimulate the dermal papilla cells in the hair follicles, which play a key role in the regulation of the hair growth cycle. They also induce the formation and proliferation of blood vessels, which sends a signal to the follicles to transition to antigen. Well, how good is it? What is the evidence? So let's take a look at the published evidence when it comes to PRP for hair loss. I'm going to take you through the literature reviews and the meta-analysis. Now, these are scientific research papers that look at many individual studies and summarize the results to reach a conclusion on effectiveness of the treatment. The difference between the two is that a literature review is a qualitative assessment, whereas a meta-analysis uses statistical methods to pin a numerical value on PRP's effectiveness. This does not mean that 
the meta-analysis are necessarily superior to the literature reviews. The various PRP studies use different treatment protocols, different measures of efficacy, and involve differing patient populations. And a meta-analysis has to put all of this through statistical meat grinder to make all the data points comparable, something which a literature review is not forced to do. So let's start with the literature reviews. The first one was published in 2018 and looked at 12 studies that took place between 2011 and 2017. In total, 295 male and female patients with androgenetic alopecia were recruited in these studies. 10 of the 12 studies produced positive results and the remaining two negative ones. Of the 10 that showed an effect for PRP, six use objective statistical analysis of quantifiable parameters like hair density and diameter, while the other four did not perform statistical analysis. All the studies with three or more treatment sessions reported positive results. However, the study with the longest follow-up period found that four out of 23 patients started to lose their new hair 12 months after the last treatment. The review highlighted the big problem with PRP, and this is the massive differences between the various treatment protocols which we discussed earlier on. Firstly, there are huge differences in the frequency and the number of sessions. The intervals between sessions range from two, three or four weeks all the way up to three months, and the total number of sessions administered ranged from one to six. The differences are also dramatic when it comes to how PRP is prepared and administered. Different studies spin the blood once or twice for different durations and at different speeds. Then there is the issue of adding so-called activators to the PRP. These are typically calcium or thrombin and are meant to increase the release of growth factors. Some studies do add activators and others don't. There are also large differences in the number, distribution and type of injections to the scalp. The second literature review was published a year later and looked at a set of nine studies. Seven of the nine studies showed positive results. The review found that the only side effect was a temporary pain at the site of the injections. There were no other major side effects. Again, the review highlighted the lack of standardization in the treatment protocols. So what about the meta-analysis? The most recent meta-analysis was published in 2017 and analyzed the results of six studies. To be included in the meta-analysis, A, a study should only have a minimum of 10 patients with hair loss, B, there should be some kind of control or comparator, and C, the increase in hairs per centimeter squares should be recorded. Measuring the new hairs per centimeter squared allows studies on PRP to be compared not only against each other, but also against studies of other androgenetic alopecia treatments. So guys, are you ready for the result? The major analysis found that the average hair regrowth per centimeter squared was 17.9 hairs. This is more or less what you get with minoxidil studies, which is 15 to 20 hairs per centimeter squared. The meta analysis also found that PRP treatment also resulted in a statistically significant difference in hair shaft thickness. So what is the percentage of responders? Well, the problem with this figure of 17.9 hairs per centimeter squared is that it's an average, and it's calculated by combining results from patients who had zero regrowth and those who had mild, moderate, or marked regrowth. So you do get a nice overall average number, but you kind of lose track of individual responses. An alternative way of measuring effectiveness is to compare the percentage of responders to non-responders. And a 2017 study out of Barcelona, Spain, gives us a good idea. The Researchers recruited 19 men and 59 men with pattern hair loss and administered a total of six PRP sessions. 71.4% of the men showed some degree of improvement, 21.4% remained stable, and 7.1% deteriorated. The figures for women were similar, 73.4% improvement, 16.3% stable, and 10.2% deterioration. You can see here the before and after photos of a male responder, and here those of a female responder. So is PRP for androgenetic alopecia actually worth it? So guys, it is the moment of truth. Is PRP worth it or should you give it a pass? If we had to give a one size fits all yes or no answer to the equation, it would have to be a no. And that's not because it doesn't work. The evidence that we reviewed suggests that it does work, though not spectacularly. The real problem is the cost. Depending on where in the US that you live, a single PRP session can set you back 500 to $1,000 or more. This means a total of five sessions can run in excess of $5,000. It's kind of impossible possible to justify this kind of money, given that it is not far off the cost of a small transplant, which will give you better results. And if you're prepared to jump on a plane and go somewhere like Mexico or Turkey, then you will actually be spending less money for a full scale transplant. And that's three or 4,000 graphs for less than what you'd spend on a series of PRP sessions. So you have to start to look at the opportunity cost, which is what other use you could be spending the PRP money on. And when you can spend the PRP money to get a transplant, it just doesn't make sense to go down this route. 
Having said that, PRP might be an option for some guys out there, and particularly those for whom budget is not an issue. For example, we're getting more and more hair surgeons who are incorporating PRP as an adjunct treatment for their transplant patients. So the same surgeon who will carry out your transplant will also administer a few PRP sessions at the same time that you get the transplant. Anecdotally, surgeons are noticing that PRP increases graft survival and gives better long-term results. Other men who might want to consider PRP are those with a more diffuse pattern of hair loss that typically responds well to either finasteride or minoxidil. Adding a few PRP sessions in the treatment protocol is thought to quote, kickstart growth and give better long-term results. Women might also benefit from having PRP in this fashion. And guys, PRP does have some clear advantages over most other treatments. For starters, the results are relatively long-lasting, but not permanent, and your new hair should last at least a year before you need more sessions. The other major advantage is the minimal time commitment. You go to your doctor once every few months, do your session, and then simply get on with your life. It's not a daily thing like minoxidil or finasteride. And the last major advantage is the more or less complete lack of side effects. So guys, dermatologists love PRP and it's being offered in more and more practices. And it's pretty easy to see why. Sure, it works. But it's also a relatively simple procedure that can generate substantial revenue in a short amount of time. So whilst it might be a very good option for a hair loss professional, it might not be the best option for the average man with hair loss. The data that we have suggests an efficacy on par with minoxidil. And for most men with hair loss, this will make PRP a very expensive impractical option, especially when considering that most insurance companies in the US will not cover this procedure, meaning that you'll have to pay out of pocket. Guys, let us know in the comments if you've tried PRP. Did you feel that it was worth the money and is it something that you'd recommend? If you click the videos on the screen now, you can learn more about the eight steps we'll use to regrow his hair as well as the truth about male pattern baldness.